Well, it's certainly an exciting time to be practicing orthodontics. You know, if you take a look around the booth here, you know, a lot of great technology. Um, things are evolving and advancing very, very rapidly. And, you know, it's not just about the tools uh, and the appliances that we're using, but it's also about the approaches to treatment. And when we started this soft tissue orthodontic program uh, a little over two years ago, you know, many, pe many people didn't really consider using injectables for applications other than perhaps, you know, treating gummy smiles. But now it's rapidly becoming standard of care for many doctors out there who we've trained. Uh, and the reason we're headed this direction, I can tell you, is because the name of the game is soft tissues. So the periodontium, the neuromusculature, the facial uh, you know, contours, all of this is what dictates our treatment as orthodontists. So knowing this reality, we certainly have to grasp a much better understanding of soft tissue function and aesthetics, but we also need to equip ourselves with the right tools to be able to take command of these soft tissues during the course of treatment. Otherwise, we're falling very short in, in terms of what we can deliver. So when we talk about uh, some of the goals that, uh, today and what this uh, talk is going to be about, it's not going to just be about you know, little you know, fun things that we can do uh, with Botox, with dermal fillers, but it's about a whole new approach and paradigm shift that's been occurring that's going to propel orthodontic treatment to the next level. Because now we no longer have to look at the soft tissues solely as obstacles to our treatment outcomes but it's something we can directly shape and affect during the course of orthodontic treatment. And that unshackles us from these traditional models solely built around the occlusion, the hard tissues, and empowers us to begin practicing soft tissue orthodontics. So one of the challenges that we, we face, though, in taking this new approach to treatment is that most of our understanding about facial aesthetics still centers around the profile. Now, this is very easy to examine and quantify, but Nonetheless, you know, these two-dimensional measurements and angles leave us with very limited information to act upon during orthodontic treatment planning, uh, and it really causes us to underestimate the true impact that we're having on the facial soft tissues. So when we take a look at um, you know, how we're going to approach treatment, we need to go ahead and perhaps look with a new set of eyes and a new approach uh, to the facial structures and to step beyond these you know, dogmatic versions of uh, soft tissue appraisals that we've had in the past. So one of the things that, uh, you know, with my background and having uh, done a extensive, um, you know, many, many years doing lots of soft tissue reconstruction for aging patients, you know, I started to notice this interplay between the soft tissue structures and the hard tissues of the dentition and the jaws themselves. So what I'm going to share with you today is kind of very briefly um, these key areas to treatment and how I'm approaching the face and how that's driving my treatment outcomes. So there's two key areas that correspond to both the upper and lower dentitions, and they're playing a very you know, essential role in driving the facial outcomes for our patients. So those are naturally the upper and lower aesthetic contours. So to define this area, the upper aesthetic contour, when, it's, um, you know, when we have these lip structures underneath the nose and where those things are tethered relative to cartilaginous components, they're not as responsive as the adjacent you know, uh, contours of the face. So this lateral third of the upper lip out to the nasal labial fold and uh, out above that upper oral commissure uh, is the upper aesthetic contour region, and that corresponds to the support from the width and the projection of the upper dental arch. The lower aesthetic contour comprises the labial mental sulcus, as well as the area out to the oral commissure and marionette line, and that lateral third of the lower lip. Both of those areas, interestingly enough, are actually the most responsive areas to changes in dental support. So now these three-dimensional studies that are coming out in recent years are validating what I have seen anecdotally, uh, and when they, you know, this study in particular has showed uh, in matched samples of patients that even a two millimeter difference between anterior projection of the upper and lower dental arches results in a very significant decline in the facial contours as a result of that inappropriate retraction. What they did find, though, is that the traditional metrics saw no change, which kind of lines up with some of other studies that we've looked at in the past. So to illustrate this point, we take a look at a patient like this. She came in. Um, in treatment at another practice. Um, and, you know, even if these teeth were in fact straight, what we see here is the, pr the problem, how's it gone? Um, the, the upper arches are very, very, very narrow, and we have a much, much, uh, you know, uh, a great deal of retroclination uh, of the upper dental arch uh, relative to where I would want to place these structures. So even though the soft tissue contours from a profile standpoint look appropriate, and many people would deem this as aesthetically acceptable, 
apart from perhaps maybe the convexity of her uh, you know, facial profile. When we step beyond this area and we look at these uh, soft tissue contours uh, in the upper and lower aesthetic contour regions, what we see is very significant decline that's not age appropriate for a 22-year-old patient. You can starting to see that folding. You know, she's got really nice full lips, great complexion, great eyes, great um, you know, uh, malar projection. But in those particular areas, we're already starting to see advanced forms of facial aging and folding of the, co of the contours that we should not see. So these details are so, so essential, especially for adolescent patients, because we're the very first professionals who are making major treatment decisions about how their face is going to mature over the rest of their lifetime. So we need to be very, very um, you know, kind of detail-oriented in how we're treatment planning and how we're uh, addressing their particular concerns. Because at the end of the day, we have to be able to deliver the goods. And we also need, in, a, in you know, conjunction with a very, uh, you know, kind of soft tissue-driven treatment approach, we need precise, consistent appliances that are going to be able to deliver what we're prescribing uh, routinely for these patients. So I'm going to walk you through a quick example of a patient in my practice um, to illustrate uh, how using a soft tissue driven approach, we're making decisions about where we place the teeth to provide an age appropriate contour for her face. So we look at this patient, you know, some significant crowding, you know, narrowing of the arches, the framework of the smile, the lower lip ca character, uh, and where the upper uh, dentition is relative to the lower lip uh, is in an appropriate relationship. You see as far as the facial convexity, it's fairly normal within normal limits. Um, but her lips, you know, many people would find that this is an appropriate amount of, uh, you know, projection relative to the nose uh, and chin. Uh, but when we look uh, at where the teeth are positioned, we notice that they're retroclined uh, and positioned backward from where we would want them relative to upper facial structures. We want to make sure that that upper incisor is paralleling her facial plane to pick up, pick up maximum light when she smiles. Uh, and then we also want to bring that forward so relative to the non-growing structures, we have a great balance between the upper and lower facial uh, soft tissues. Because of that retroclination, what we're seeing in those areas that I outlined for you is very significant uh, folding and concavity in both the upper and lower aesthetic contours. So what we want to do with treatment for this patient and taking kind of an outside-in approach, we know that we don't have the level of support that we want. So our treatment goals are going to be to expand and advance the dentition to provide appropriate contours to the facial structure while achieving a bite correction. There's certainly a significant amount of crowding here, so we're gonna have uh, very little difficulty in advancing these teeth. Um, we also have a significant midline shift and a deep bite as well. What's interesting is when we look at this approach, we don't wanna go ahead and uh, make presumptions about you know, the, the width of these dental arches and where they need to be. We need to look at our goals for the face and make a determination about how the dental alveolus and the periodontal apparatus is going to be able to accommodate our treatment goals. So when I look here, from a soft tissue standpoint, I'm looking at the width of the attached gingiva, I'm looking at the level of perfusion, which we're able to see when we retract these lips for appropriate photos, and then I'm also looking at the phenotype of the tissue here. So we have a very thick phenotype, good perfusion of the tissue. The one problem area and, and concern we have is this lower displaced canine uh, where the tissue is very thin. So in our treatment mechanics, we're going to go ahead and take an approach that is respectful of the soft tissues there and, and we don't overload or overstrain the soft tissues in aligning the bite. We also have a unilateral class two, which we're gonna correct for this patient naturally. So in our goals, we're gonna correct the bite obviously, we're gonna expand the arches, but what's driving the mechanics and the approach is not you know, just the occlusion, it's the facial structure, it's the soft tissue contours, and what we've outlined here as our treatment goals for this patient. So when she came in, this is where she was. We went ahead uh, and placed uh, the motion appliance unilaterally to correct the bite here with the lower Essex. This is our third appointment. Um, the bite is corrected. We're three months into treatment. At that same appointment, we're placing braces. Now, because we noticed, especially in the lower here, how thin that tissue was, I'm bypassing the significant crowding to provide um, you know, less binding in the system, light forces, widening out these arches in a respectful way before we start engaging uh, these ectopically erupting canines. We have the bite uh, turbos to go ahead and disclude the patient. Now, the, you know, the research that's been in the AJO about inner arch collisions shows that occlusal forces are reducing uh, the speed of tooth movement by about 30%, so I would highly suggest that you routinely disclude patients uh, in a strategic fashion. 
We've placed them on the upper incisors here because when we're using those strategic bite forces on the front teeth, we're able to control the rotation of that occlusal plane to make sure that we preserve the smile arc during the course of treatment. So we're now engaging at our fifth month, fourth appointment, that tooth. I now have extra space and I can begin to engage those very crowded lower uh, anterior teeth. We did have a broken bracket on that lower right uh, lateral incisor. I'm at the eighth month in treatment, eight appointments total. We're here at 10 and a half months. And what I do to finish up these cases, so that way I can save appointments and leverage the digital technology that we have at our disposal, uh, is to make the bends, scan the patient. Those bends are then mirrored in the final retainers that I'm going to produce. So these thermoplastic retainers are going to act as an active bite settler. And here we are in 11 months of treatment. So you can see here before and after, 11 months, only three, only eight of those months were in fixed appliances. Three of the months were in the motion appliance. So this is a very, very efficient way to practice. My, you know, I looked at the last 10, you know, uh, removals that I had. It's about 10.1 uh, months per, you know, on average for patients for, with our fixed appliances. And the reason we're doing this is because we've tightened up those initial intervals to six weeks, uh, because we know that with the SLX system, we're being able to efficiently align those teeth and initial arch wires with a much shorter interval. Uh, we're also going ahead and using the digital technology with 3D printing to get out of treatment a little bit more efficiently. So that's why we're able to go ahead and make these types of corrections uh, in a short time period here, and with less time in fixed appliances. What we also see is now we've advanced and provided a little bit better support from a profile standpoint. You can see how I've paralleled uh, the upper incisor relative to her facial plane and been respectful there. And you can see even from the frontal view where uh, we've achieved more support in those key aesthetic contours. You can see the smile arc has been maintained. And in those areas now we can see how by advancing the dentition and providing the, the right amount of uh, support for her particular age, we've lifted that oral commissure by advancing the lower dentition, by broadening these arches and advancing the teeth, we've provided a really nice uh, soft tissue envelope that's going to you know, age well for her. We don't want her to look 25 when she's only 14, okay? So what do we do when tooth movement alone is gonna get us only 80, 90% of the way there? Well. Our understanding and our you know, kind of uh, mindset as orthodontists and being essentially the prime movers in, uh, in terms of facial aesthetics for these young patients, we not only need to place the teeth in an appropriate spot for you know, a good facial foundation, but we need to use tools to expand and extend our uh, impact on the face in the areas that we're responsible for. So when we take a look at this patient who comes in, you know, certainly she's got concerns with uh, tooth alignment. Her dental support is appropriate. You can see that there's a little bit of a cant to her midline. The arches are narrow. We're not going to be able to broaden them too much. In an adult, you know, that arch form is fairly set. Um, you know, we can just get a little bit more, maybe two millimeters out of that for her. But her concern, in addition to this, that she mentioned was her excess gingival display. So we want to go ahead and begin to reduce that for her. The reason why we have that excessive gingival display is not hyperactivity of the muscles, but a retruded uh, nasomaxillary complex where the upper lip uh, doesn't have the same level of volume that we would require uh, in a patient her age. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to improve her facial balance by uh, augmenting the soft tissues with fillers uh, to go ahead and kind of balance in these areas that we're responsible for uh, the uh, facial soft tissues while we're improving the alignment naturally. So of course, you know, in about eight months with uh, some aligners, we get things uh, lined up. You know, she's happy with them. But the more important aspect of this, besides, you know, uh, lining the bite, is how we've uh, started to kind of balance the facial profile and the facial appearance. So when we look at the front, um, you know, the frontal view here, what I did was uh, I augmented her upper maxilla uh, with some Voluma. I went ahead and, uh, you know, volumized her upper lip to create a better balance between the upper and lower vermilions. Uh, while reducing her gingival display. And I used uh, you know, Botox to relax some of the muscles around the eyes, which were causing her some headaches, to provide some lift and just a much more uh, you know, re refreshed and relaxed appearance for her. So she's very happy, and you can see how that augmentation of the upper lip has reduced the gingival display and created a much more balanced smile for her. So if I didn't have these tools, 
what would I have to do? Well, I would have to accept all of these inefficiency, insu you know, insufficiencies within the outcome that you know, basically I wouldn't be able to address uh, without having the ability to use fillers uh, and Botox for her. This is not limited just to you know, the facial structures as well. We can apply these concepts to engineering uh, regrowth of the papilla. So you can see here, this was a sequential um, you know, injections in about uh, a week to 10 days apart. And what I'm doing is providing a substrate within the interdental tissues to allow that papilla to thrive and regrow uh, to fill uh, the hard tissue housing of the bone and the teeth that surround the interdental space. So we use this, there's a, you know, uh, it's a little bit longer to kind of go through the official technique, but this is kind of an example. Gary Brigham was at our course in, in Vegas, and you know, I never videotaped things. He had a camera, he had a patient, so I injected um, you know, papilla for him while he videotaped to kind of demonstrate this technique. Um, so now we've got some video, which is great. So basically what I'm doing is I'm sliding in you know, with a particular um, you know, uh, selection of uh, hyaluronic acid. Uh, filler and placing that right at the uh, the crest of bone interdentally. I'm then going to go ahead and just very slowly express that. You'll see a little tissue blanching. Some filling happens immediately, but what we're trying to do is create inflammation and a substrate for the body to use to leverage, you know, better growth and wound healing of the papilla in that particular area. When they've sampled the marginal, uh, you know, uh, periodontal tissue and the interdental periodontal tissue, what they've noticed is the phenotype of the cells is distinct within the interdental tissue. It's in a more rapid turnover and state of wound healing. So by providing um, materials for the body to use, we leverage that, you know, kind of natural state of the cells to produce growth of the papilla. So what I've done then at the end of that is I've gone in and just kind of disturbed the tissue a little bit after I've provided about you know a tenth to two tenths of a cc of material, um, and I'm going to go in and prime the papilla for the next appointment by you know just kind of wiggling the needle in there a little bit, and you can see now that we're expressing a little extra out. So this is that particular patient. Gary sent me the the final photo, but you can see with that uh, patient with just one treatment, the nice response that we've had to regrow that tissue in between the teeth. And the question is, you know, well, how long does this last? Because we're engineering new, new tissue here, um, in the same way that using PRP or stem cells and other, you know, kind of, uh, you know, research projects that are going on, um, you know, we're able to go ahead and have at least two years of stability of this new tissue that's in these, uh, um, you know, interdental spaces. And it's a really, really wonderful service that we can provide for patients. We have great control over the hard tissues. We can parallel the roots. We can adjust the connectors. We can go ahead uh, and have the dentist change the shape of the crown, but in order to address the soft tissue component, we need the right tools to go in there and be able to uh, regrow this tissue. So, you know, it's, it's interesting now to kind of consider all this when we look at what the scope of practice is for orthodontists. And these are both, you know, essentially advertising the same thing, but they're two wholly different products. You have, you know, crest right strips here on the right or on the left, and uh, Botox on, on the right there, and essentially they're providing the exact same you know, kind of message to the patients, a youthful appearance, wonderful white, beautiful looking smile, and these are what our adult patients are looking for. And it's also what the adult patients are looking for for their children long term when we get to use growth and determine how we want to place uh, the teeth and other structures relative to that growth that's occurring at the time. So you know, if we're considering what our scope of practice is and we understand and recognize that we have a defining role in how these contours uh, develop by placing the teeth, we have to have that understanding to go ahead and you know, inform the patient and even direct them perhaps to other specialists to do this. But we may also want to elect to develop the skills in the same way that we place TADS in our practice to go ahead and address these concerns directly so that way we can achieve a better level of outcome for our patients. And it's very important as we move forward, and especially, especially how the specialty develops, because you know, if we're gonna to continue to remain relevant and address the full needs of our patients, we need to really you know, kind of wrap both of our arms around this concept and about our role and what our true scope of practice is gonna be from an airway standpoint, from a facial contour standpoint, from a soft tissue orthodontic standpoint. So I thank you for your time. I'm gonna have uh, Marie go through you know, some of the sales and different things that we've got going on here at the booth today. Um, and then you know, I can step off to the side for any questions. Thank you.